This is Duke University. Hi, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Chi Chan. I'm the accounting professor at Duke. Uh, as the moderator for the session, I have the honor to introduce to you our speaker for the session, Mr. Hugh Bernstein. Bernstein. Um, Mr. Bernstein is the co-founder of Bernstein and Pinta, that's it, right? Uh, and he's currently the co-managing director of Markham, Bernstein and Pinta which is one of the largest middle market accounting firms servicing China-based U.S. publicly traded companies. There's local offices in major Chinese cities, including Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Hangzhou. Uh, in addition to his extensive working experiences in China, Mr. Bernstein has also served as an accountant and business advisors worldwide, providing specialized auditing and accounting services to public and non-public companies throughout the United States, Europe, and Africa. Mr. Bernstein also served as the director and chairman of the audit committees of several public companies, and is a frequent speaker at industry, investment banking, and university conferences. He's an active member of the board of directors and officer of a prestigious foundation that was honored with the President's Voluntary Action Award by the late President Ronald Reagan. We're very pleased to have Mr. Bernstein here to share with us his insight on investing in Asia. Uh, the format of the discussion will be a 50 minutes of PowerPoint presentation by Mr. Bernstein, and the audience should feel free to ask questions during the presentation. And we'll shoot to uh, have a cold, uh, sort of hard start to stop at 5 to 4, so we have time to move to Jimmy. Okay, well, without further ado, thank you, Mr. McBernstein. Thank you, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. I have to confess, though, that I was a Terrapin, but we didn't win much in those days, so it's OK. Um, what I've done today, I've put together a presentation for you today. It's sort of like this 30,000-foot view of China. It's going to cover a lot of areas. Uh, my experience is in China. I've spent the last 14 years commuting there. Um, you know, the title I gave this was Lessons from the Front Lines, and that actually emanated from the fact, you know, when I first met, my wife is Chinese. When I first met my wife, we were having dinner, she looked across the table from me, she said, you know, you're really smart. And I looked at her, I said, you know, it's kind of funny, we're having dinner. I thought maybe you'd say I was really cute or handsome, like, why smart? And she looked at me and says, well, because, you know, you're bald. <laughs> My wife is so smart. She's a Beijinger, OK? I looked at her and I said, uh, well, obviously not that smart to connect the dots. I said, so maybe you can explain it to me. She goes, oh, it's really simple. She goes, you know, now that I really know you, men like you, you never learn anything until your head actually hits the wall. She goes, obviously your head's had a lot of times. It's bleeding a little bit. Maybe you should learn to walk backwards. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today is kind of how I got bald. Um, my firm is probably about the 14th or 15th largest firm in the United States. We have about 80 employees in China with four offices. And our principal business in China is representing Chinese companies that are public on US exchanges. We also do represent some companies that are on Hong Kong and Shenzhen and Shanghai. But our principal business is advising those groups of companies. I've also sat on some boards of Chinese companies as an audit committee chair. I've probably run one of the largest investigations. I know if you know anything about the China market, you've seen a lot of turmoil over the last years. I've run one of the largest investigations in China against one of the most notorious short sellers. So I have a lot of experience in China. I spend about, I'd say, about a week to 10 days every five weeks. I travel a quarter of a million miles a year. I've visited China over 100 times. I've probably worked in 150 cities in China. So from a geographical standpoint, I probably know China better than most Chinese. I speak a lot of conferences. 
Uh, I'm a source for a lot of the news agencies. Um, there's a lot of other people that do this too. Um, our firm, this is just a little bit about our firm. I'm required to do that, okay? So, um, but we do have probably one of the most significant practices in China in this area. We don't do Chinese taxes or consulting. We principally you know, represent this small, small part of the market. Th why invest in China? And you know, we're talking about Asia too, but when you talk about Asia, much of Asia is China. And you know, one of the things I talk about is any economic formula or business that you can dream of I assure you, when you plug 1.5 billion into it, it works. <laughs> Guaranteed. And as you heard this morning, you know, that is the allure of China. And you can see right now, though, that you have to ask yourself, it looks pretty scary, because against the S&P, it's almost a straight downward turn. Chinese stocks have not done that well until recently. Now, in the last two years, there's been 10 IPOs in China. Only 10 in two years. And eight of them were last year. All of them are doing really well. Very strong, you know, that I would consider. Um, these actually, I picked these three because I say six months, but they were actually done all in the last three months of the year. And you have some huge ones coming down the pipe right now. Alibaba, for those of you who know that, that's coming down. That may be one of the largest IPOs ever to be done. Now, you know, when these, I put up a listing of all 10 over here. And the one that I would probably single out to make note of mostly would be the one in the middle, China Commercial Credit. Now, China Commercial Credit was done in September of last year. And what you don't see on this list is every single one of these deals is 75 million and up, except for that one, which is 15. And until this deal came out, most of the thinking in the market was that you had to be a big, sexy, attractive deal to be able to do an IPO in China. And then here comes this little micro-credit deal. For me, no special business platform. It was in the shadow banking business. Small raise, $15 million raise. Um, you know, people were just amazed that, that it could happen. And the real reason that it happened, it was one of those rare instances when the chairman of the Chinese company and the investment banker were exactly on the same page. And they did things that you would not normally see in a deal, because neither were greedy. And for me, that was one of the most perfect deals that was done this last year. Now, as an overview to China, there's two different ways, I think, to look at China. Um, the optimistic way you know, to look at China, I always say, is like looking at China through a picture, a static picture. And since post-cultural revolution, China has gone from zero to the second largest economy in the world, poised to be number one, not six. Second largest military in the world. Their economy is 10 times the size of Russia's right now. So in 40 years, to make those kind of accomplishments is amazing. So in that sense, you have to give them enormous credit. I think the issue comes when you look at China more through what I call a movie where you could look at those 40 years. And if you did that, you'd probably be pretty disappointed in the last 10. Because in the last 10, you know, from, from a social standpoint, I think China is almost socially bankrupt in the sense that there's not a city in China with air you can breathe, poor education system, poor medical system, no parks, no libraries, poor, poor road system. 
enormous amount of improvements that have to happen. And from an, econo from, from an economic standpoint, um, in the early 90s, you really had what I considered to be a period of economic liberalization. And at that point, they were trying to dismantle the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, and promote small business and entrepreneurship. And in the last 10 years, you know, from my vantage point, I've actually seen that process not slow down, but actually kind of go backwards. The SOEs in China have become enormously powerful. And in today's environment, unlike at least when I grew up, where supply and demand dictated the economies, in a lot of economies today, governments dictate the economies. Government, they dictate the money supply. They dictate what businesses do well, what businesses don't well, who gets money, who doesn't get money. So understanding the effects of governments and how they affect economies is critical. Um, obviously, right now, China is driving you know, global growth. When you look around the world, you see the United States right now is broke. Europe right now, severe problems. France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece. And when you look at the countries that do have cash, I'm not saying they're necessarily great economies at the moment, but the ones that have cash, you're looking at Japan, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea. So, and you can see right now that China is larger than almost everybody else put together. They're driving growth in Asia. And to give you an idea of how big China is, you know, 1.5 billion today, especially if you say dollars, just doesn't sound like a lot of money anymore. But when you put 1.5 billion in terms of people, you know, the United States right now has nine cities, Hawaii being the 10th that's borderline, that have populations greater than a million. Does anybody want to guess how many cities China has? 161. That's how big 1.4 or 5 billion is. It's amazing. With 10 megacities. As China goes, so goes Asia. As I just said before, you can see right now that China is larger than the next four put together. Any questions so far? You know, it's a small enough group right now, so if people have questions you want to interrupt in the middle, just raise your hand. I'll be try to happy to ask the questions as we go through. Um, they basically own us. Now, <laughs> I chose some of these cartoons because I thought they were just so accurate as well as being funny. Um, but what you've seen recently is an enormous outflow of cash from China. Now, in China, you have 70% of the wealth in less than 1% of the population. It also happens that 1% one pop, 1 of the population happens to also run China, too. But a lot of that money left China for issues, really, of not investment, more security driven. And one of the things that is most interesting, and I'll talk a little bit about later, is not so much investing in China, but what people are calling now cross-border transactions. How do we get a piece of the pie that the Chinese are spending here? And I'll get a little bit into that. That's a really interesting topic. but. You know, what happened is you had this enormous amount of outflow from China. And, you know, they started investing in everything right now. So it's not only the fact that they're holding all of our debt, 
They're also now starting to buy a lot of the assets in the United States. The Chinese are the second largest purchasers of real estate in the United States right now behind the Canadians. And they're, they're participating in areas that you would never imagine, like bankruptcy. Now, you know, I look at your faces, and I said the same thing. You know, you think of bankruptcy and China in the same sentence, and it's like thinking Pope and stem cells. You know, they just don't go together. But if you think about it, every time, if you narrow it by sector, right, like let's say manufacturing and technology, every time a U.S. company, U.S. company goes bankrupt, who do you think the vendor creditors are? Not the secured creditors, the banks and the hedge funds, but the people making the product are the Chinese. They are the creditors. And I can tell you statistically, less than 5% of those Chinese creditors, even though they're the largest, ever participate in the US bankruptcy process. And everybody knows how Chinese love deals. Well, that's what bankruptcy is about. So you're seeing a lot of Chinese companies stepping up right now, and they're the bidders right now, and a lot of the US assets, brands, that are going up for sale. You've seen that in Smithfield Foods. You've seen it in Jennifer Convertibles. So the Chinese are stepping up right now and are some of the biggest buyers of bankrupt assets in the United States. So they're participating in so many ways. It's not just debt-driven. It's really asset-driven, too. We held a conference in Beijing last September, had about over 400 people there, about 75 companies, almost 120 funds. And if there was two main takeaways from that conference for me, one was the cross-border transactions, as I described to you. The other was the Chinese companies, because even though the, the companies have a stigma to themselves right now as being bad companies, the market looks at it and says, you know, by my count, there's about 200, 250 you know, companies out there worthy of us keeping track of. Now, if you make the assumption that all those companies are bad, what that really means in numbers is 80 to 85% of them are bad. And there's still 30 to 40 companies out that, there that are selling for 60 to 80% under value. Now, to investment bankers, that's free cash. Because if you have a company that has a market value of, say, 100 million, and you can buy that, let's say it's all cash, and you can buy it for an 80% discount, that's free money. So there's a tremendous amount of interest in certain Chinese companies. I can tell you, though, the interest is by a limited group of investors. Um, it's not the mom and pop investors. I think what we're seeing right now is most of the Asian companies, the better ones, are actually being more institutionally driven than individual shareholder driven. So a lot of the individual shareholders are being replaced by institutions that are buying their positions out. Um, but they look at that and they say that these stocks are so cheap that we need to buy them. The only problem is, is that there's a due diligence issue. And the question they're asking is, which one is the good one? That could be a little tougher to find out. What's your take on the main reasons for them being so cheap now? Wow. The simple answer to that question, the simple answer to the question is that you had a sufficient amount of Chinese companies that were willing to misrepresent their financial statements, and there was enough of them that created a stigma to the market. That would be the simple, probably most common understanding. Um, I think the correct ex explanation and closer to the truth is that the market the market lost confidence not just in Chinese companies. You know, the US side was as bad as the Chinese side, I assure you. We just don't like to talk about it that much. But what the market was really upset about is not only did you have these Chinese companies that misrepresented their financial statements, 
but they looked at everybody that participated in the process. They looked at the accountants, and they said, well, you guys didn't do a good job because you guys, in China, you guys hid behind brands, okay? In China, what they do is many of the second tier firms are not the firms they are here. They're independent members of these organizations, and essentially, you know, that's a single office practicing under a brand. So we hid behind that, and as accountants, we're supposed to catch fraud. There was a lot of fraud. You didn't catch it. So they're mad at the accounting world. They're mad at the lawyers, because the lawyers, I had a meeting with CV Star about two years ago. CV Star is one of the principal DO insurers in China. That's directors and officers insurance, which is necessary in order to have a board. They had paid out over $300 million in claims two years ago. And I assure you, very little of that got to the shareholders. And there's probably 30 or 40 investigations still going on of Chinese companies where there's no conclusion. I'm working on a case right now where the law firm that was working with this company who was having problems, who eventually ended up in bankruptcy, were liquidating their assets. Now, this law firm went to work for 18 months to try to help this company. The net result of all that help was the company is bankrupt. They're selling off the assets. The legal bill for the 18 months was $10 million. So the market's really upset that all these professional fees have been paid out and companies haven't gotten value. They're upset about the investment bankers because they went out and they took a lot of Chinese companies public to make fees. And they had no business taking those companies public. And even when they did take them public, they didn't give them proper follow-up support after they did take them public. And lastly, I think, you have a playing field that's vastly unfair to Chinese companies because you have shorts and whistleblowers that only have to be less than 50% right to destroy a Chinese company like that. And the company has to be 150% right, spend millions of dollars, and have a chance of digging their way out. Can I have a follow-up? Go ahead. Uh, you may touch on this later on, so feel free to postpone. One of the reasons that you mentioned is the lack of trust in the financial statements by the Chinese companies. Uh, that's where auditors come in, right? A lot well, of it's lack of trust by the investment by community, the investment. not the companies. By the investment com uh, community about the uh, credibility of the financial statements of Correct. Chinese companies. Many of the Chinese uh, companies are actually audited by the US auditors, their local offices, but still there are associated the auditors who still sign the name of KPMG and PwC, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, I don't know if your firm actually audits some of the <coughs> we Chinese do. companies. How do you respond to that when, when they... Well, our it? advice, our advice to the, I mean, you know, my experience is on kind of both sides because I've, as an audit committee chair, you're on the, the, the company's side. So I have kind of this very unique perspective of it. And there's no one thing that I've been able to think of to come up with that would be the solution. You know, like an antibiotic, you're sick, you take the antibiotic, you get better. And I really think the solution lies more in, as we say, the straw that broke the, camel ba the camel's back, where there's, if companies can do things that are enough of them that are undisputably good for investors, Examples of that, pay dividends, right? Resolve shareholder lawsuits. Simplify ownership structure. Build up cash, right? Because when a company builds up cash, they don't get concerned about doing pipes and diluting the existing investors. So when companies can do things like that that are undisputably good for investor, I never heard an investor complain to the company that, you know, you sent me a dividend check. You know, why did you do that? I mean, there's other things that companies can do, buybacks by the directors. I don't particularly like it that much. I think it does have a good effect. But if you're really relying on that, for that to be the meat of what you're doing, it really doesn't work because no matter what you do, it's never the right amount. If you buy $10 million worth of stock back as a CEO, 
the market comes back and say, see, CEO had no confidence. He didn't buy $50 million worth of stock. So there's just no substitute for paying dividends. You know? So my advice to those companies is that if you do things, if you do enough good things that are undisputably good for investors, they can't not buy your stock. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think uh, I'd like to really follow this. His question really so why you have international recognized accounting firm do the, you know, accounting for the Chinese company? Still, you have a lot of fraud. Yeah, still not the standardized. Why that? That's the, maybe the question behind it. Um, that's a really good question. And you know, it's something I, I was actually working on an article with accounting today about this. And a lot of the auditing standards that we do in China are actually kind of at the forefront of developing new standards to be used in what I consider to be underdeveloped financial markets. Now, an example of what I'm talking about, to be clear, for instance, the auditing of cash. Now, in the United States, when you audit cash, I don't care if it's $100 million. You know, you do, you do a confirmation. You independently mail it. It comes back to you from the bank, stamped, authorized. And that's good evidential matter for an audit. Now, if I did that in China, I'd lose my license. And we do very extensive procedures in China. One, understanding the, the, the sphere of influence of the company. Because if the company's in a small town, it could be possible that the company employs the bank manager's entire family. So he has a lot of influence indirectly. So we do a lot of work in understanding what the sphere of influence of the company is and to make sure that when we go to the bank that we get outside that sphere of influence. We may go to Shanghai or Beijing or some city to confirm cash. That's not normally done. And there's a lot of issues in China about receivables, obviously. You have receivables from SOEs, state-owned enterprises. That could be a little funky. Um, so there's really almost a different set of auditing standards that have been used over there right now. So, so, and so basically you're saying the macro <coughs> infrastructure, the lack of enforcement, and the Chinese unique uh, settings uh, render the credibility of internationally reputable accounting firms uh, somewhat useless because your, your, well, your, I don't your ability is constrained in enforcing the higher standards or ex executing the auditing practices? Well, first of all, these are not the same accounting firms that you're familiar with. Pricewaterhouse in China is not Pricewaterhouse in the United States. I know they go by the same name, but they are different firms. And Pricewaterhouse in the United States, for instance, probably audits 1,000 clients on the exchanges. I'm just choosing a number. I really don't know. Pricewaterhouse in China audits, I don't know, 30 companies. The experience level, I think, is really different. Um, and obviously, the way, Chinese, and the way Chinese companies run is completely different. And especially once you get past the big four in China, there's an enormous drop off. And that's one of the main issues in China right now, just lack of talent. There's only there's less than 2,000 registered US CPAs in China. Tiny. So in fairness to a lot of Chinese companies, even ones that want to do the right thing, it becomes very difficult for them to obtain the right resources, even when they want to pay and find out. So that's one of the most challenging things in developing an accounting staff and good financials. Crisis, opportunity, I mean, you know, with the market the way it is right now, I mean, the investment bankers love this kind of environment. And um, I'm just, you know, I give you some idea here of what's happening in China. It's going completely the other way.
I call it the sausage factory because there's just everything there. You know, you come across just everything, so it's just an incredible mix. And I've kind of, you know, weeded out these kind of areas um, because I think these are some of the most significant areas, you know, to really go over. Financial statements. Um, I think this is where you're getting at, Professor. <laughs> um, everybody understands Chinese companies don't run like traditional US companies. They have a CEO, and he makes all the decisions in the company, and the board of directors and everybody else has very, very little influence. So if you don't have connection to the chairman, you better understand who's in his circle of friends. Um, and it is difficult because you, know, you have a company that's operating in one completely different business environment that's trying to fit into rules of another environment. And I'll get into later what they call the VIE issues, which really exemplify this. It's crazy. But they do it. Um, these are some of the real key assets, you know, the, the key issues that come up in most of our audit clients. Um, you know, cash verification. And you've seen basically blow-ups of companies for almost every one of these issues. Now, um, some very famous ones. Um, and the bottom one is something I just wanted to mention to people. It's called the VIE issue. And this, to me, is uh, you got to give credit to the US lawyers for dreaming this one up. But China has a rule that prohibits foreigners from owning more than 50% of a domestic Chinese company. So how do you take a company public if you can't own it? Seems kind of crazy, isn't it? So what they did is they dreamed up this structure called the VIE. It's called the Variable Interest Entity. And essentially what it does is through management contracts, it basically strips the company of the economics as if it was done on an equity basis. Does anybody understand what I just said? No. OK, thank you. What I mean by that is if you can't legally own a company, but you, you do management contracts so that economically you can own the company. Can you understand that? Yeah. We're not going to control it. Right. So the cash flow goes to you. Right. So the cash flows as if you own the company, which works perfectly until somebody doesn't like it. And you've had already two cases in China go through the Chinese court systems where they tell you that this doesn't work. Where the Chinese courts have basically said, you know, this is really circumventing Chinese law and it doesn't work. But it's still used actively. Um, also, Professor, this is current news, what I consider. Um, you've had a lot going. I, over the last couple of years, you've had all these problems going on between the US government and Chinese government about the accounting irregularities, um, the inspection of accounting firms by uh, the PCAOB in China. And it really came to a culmination in two ways. Um, about three months ago, if you can see on the bottom here, there was an MOU, a Memor of, uh, Memorandum of Understanding sign between the US and Chinese government. Now I read it, this was a six page document. So you can imagine when two governments write an agreement that's six pages, it didn't say a lot. Um, but it was sort of left up to intent. And I, I can kind of understand it, because every time in my life that I've had to refer to a piece of paper to find out who was right or wrong, I was in trouble. Um, but the MOU in itself did say a lot. And it, it did say that the government recognized that 
the credibility of Chinese companies was important because you have the Hong Kong Exchange, the Shanghai Exchange, Shenzhen Exchange, and they're not stupid. And they saw what happened. And you know, one of the issues I have, and it's my own opinion, is that to date, the Chinese government has said it's OK to steal from Laois, foreigners. But don't even think of stealing from Chinese. Now, you've had about 70 cases right now where not one Chinese chairman has been prosecuted. That really upsets people. And you have one case in Harbin where the chairwoman of a Chinese company listed on the Shanghai Exchange stole $20 million, and she got executed. So they deal with the Chinese a little bit differently. And what the market's looking for right now is at least for the playing field to be leveled for everybody, you know, not, not just Chinese. Now, they signed this MOU. And then a few weeks ago, a judge comes down with a ruling telling them that the big four firms are all going to be suspended and sanctioned because they refuse to comply with a subpoena to turn over papers. Now, the firms in China actually would want to turn over the papers. They just don't want to go to jail, which I understand. So they've been fighting. And then, then a judge comes along and decides, I'm just going to suspend all four of them. And he did. Now, there was a lot of different, I've done a lot of interviews on this, and I, you could spend a lot of time on it. How much do I have? We're we getting there. Um, my opinion on this is this is a governmental problem. This is not a judicial problem. And what the judicial process did do is it sent word loud and clear that they want to see progress of the process to both sides, US and Chinese. And um, you had about a week after this, Deloitte joined with the SEC and in fact said we've complied with the you know we've complied with the subpoena and they're actually my you know word is that they'll get off and um, these sanctions don't even come into play for probably six months to a year because these firms have the ability to appeal the uh, decision None of the sanctions go into play until after it. So my expectations are that these companies are going to follow suit with Deloitte and do whatever Deloitte did and try to follow suit and get rid of it. But one thing the suit did do is it set a window to get things done. And that window is sometime between four months and a year. Um, these are some just takeaways that I put down for investors. Um, you know, the accounting firms, as I said, have really stepped up their procedures of auditing companies right now. We've really extended procedures greatly. We know that especially the larger companies are under enormous amount of scrutiny. So you've seen the standards increase dramatically. And I mean, I had written an article that was published in the China Daily about a year ago, you know, just on this. Chinese management is absolutely unique. It's not like I've seen anywhere in the world. And, you know, one of the major, I think, mistakes that were made by some of the investment bankers when they went to China originally is they made the assumption, like in the United States, that when you take a company public, and you tell a chairman of a company that, look, we're going to give you $20 million. Now, if you do everything you say you can do, in three years, this $20 million for you is going to turn into 100 And that chairman said to himself, wow, $20 million. You know, I can barely afford an apartment in Manhattan for that. So I need $100 million. And he stays in the game and does it. In China, what we saw mostly was that a lot of the chairman at that point, they never saw $20 million in their life in the last 5,000 years. And what happened was the chairman typically took most of that money, left maybe you know, 
a small part of it in the company. The company ran for a couple of years and just dissipated. So that was, you know, common because they didn't want to wait around for the other money. There was more money than they had ever seen before. And most of the time when they raised 30 million, the chairman would take five or 10 million off the top. And for the next two years, the company looked like it was running great because it was spending 20 million. And if business went up and they could cover it, that's great. And if it didn't, which it usually didn't, they were out. Um, these are, you know, evaluating, the mo evaluating management is really, really key. Understanding, you know, it's one of the first things I do when I get into a Chinese company is I try to understand who has the influence with the chairman. Um, that's critical. You know, Chinese live in circles of friends, and it's really important to understand, in, you know, with a Chinese chairman, who his circle of influence is. Because without that, it's really hard to make any kind of progress. And it's really difficult to influence them um, to hire normal boards and having normal operations, internal controls, very difficult. <laughs> Investing as a blood sport. Um, these are, it's sort of a discussion I think I had a little earlier. Um, these are where shorts, I don't, anybody, does everybody here understand what a short seller is? Yes? Short sellers are simply people that bet the opposite way. They bet the stock's going to go down. Um, the only thing is, they also can carry a lot of influence in the market on how that happens, which I'll get into a little bit later. These are some of the short sellers. Now, the most amazing thing to me about short sellers is their biggest complaint against Chinese companies is lack of transparency. And it completely blows my mind because I dare anyone in the audience right now to find out, tell me the phone number, email address, or address, anything about any one of these companies. You can't find it. You know, you want to talk about people that complain about others about lack of transparency, you can't even find where these people are. And it's an amazing business. Um, they've, you know, completely collapsed the market in China. And typically what they do, the way they operate, they sell themselves as analysts. And what they do basically is they, they obtain subscribers, subscribers, which are typically hedge funds. And then what they do is they target a company. And then what they do is they sell their research or they provide their research in advance of publishing it to their subscribers who many times also help them accumulate the short position. And then what they do is they publish their report in normal media. And within minutes, they're all gone and out, and they've all made their money. And they really don't care what happens after that. It's literally over in minutes. That's how fast they make money. And they don't make money like money money, like million. They make tens of millions. Enormous. How, how they make their money? By selling the report to the hedge fund? Or they have percentage with the hedge fund? No. Actually, they make their money two ways. One, they make money, some money, in fees, all right? Because people pay them fees in order to be able to get their research in advance. And then what they do is they go out and they accumulate a short position. It means they go out and they actually find people that own the shares that are willing to lend the shares to them. 
And then what they do is they publish their report. Well, they know once they publish their report, the stock is going to tank. And the minute the stock tanks, they, they buy back the stock to replace what they borrowed. OK? So as an example, first of all, you don't need, theoretically, you don't need any money. You can make tens of millions of dollars without having any money. Although you really need it, you know, technically, nobody lends it to you without security. But essentially, all you're doing is you're going out and you borrow 100 shares of stock. And you turn around and you sell it. And let's say the stock's at 10. So you have $1,000 in your hand, right? Now you go and publish your research report. The stock goes from 10 down to 1. So you now go back into the market. You go repurchase the 100 shares for $100, give it back to who you borrowed it from, and you go home. So they take short positions themselves instead of the Oh, yeah, that's how they make money. They forget the research part. They make money by accumulating positions themselves. Why would hedge funds subscribe to their newsletters? Oh, because they are some of the biggest shorters. Hedge funds do a lot of shorting. They, they take provisions. Oh, together. sure. Okay. So with the subscriptions, are they telling um, their subscribers to invest at first to bump the stock price up, and then they publish the report to get the stock they price basically, up? Basically, as becoming a subscriber, it basically enables you to get a hold of their research before it gets published. But is it the same exact research that yeah. they're publishing later? Okay. Yeah. So I was thinking like they're doing the same thing that Merrill did before, which they're telling their consumer division one side they're boosting up the stock price, and then on their investment banking side they would tell the uh, well, but they're only on one side here, okay. right? They don't really care. So he's not the bad guy. What's that? <laughs> well, not totally. You see, for me, honestly, there's two types of shorts. Now. Um, Muddy Waters, uh, probably the most infamous here. He's actually who I went up against when I did my investigation. Um, he's probably the most notorious of them. And I consider somebody like him a criminal and what I call a pure short. That means he never bets long and all they do is you know, go out to destroy companies and hopefully, you know, what well, doesn't really matter if they're right or wrong because they can affect the market. Um, those are the bad types up here. There's other shorts like Alfred Little. I actually know that guy really well. And he really was a researcher, a brilliant researcher. And he was looking for good Chinese companies. And what happens when your really good research turns up frauds or bad companies, and you're allowed to bet short because not every firm allows people to bet short, then you do. So some of these people you know, became shorts because they were just brilliant researchers, and their brilliant research looking for good investments turned up bad ones, right? Because frauds typically look like great investments. I mean, there's one investment that, well, they're not up here, but another company did. And it was one of the most astounding ones I've, I've ever seen because most companies in China, from my experience, are not complete frauds. They're actually real businesses that have been either inflated or greatly inflated, but there's usually a core business. Now, this company was called LPH. It was a delivery company of chemicals. Now, my friends were looking at this company, and you know, they just, it just, the sales just didn't seem to pan out with the rest of the financials. And about two weeks before earnings, the company came out and increased its earnings estimate, which infuriated my friends. So what they did is they went to the company, and they put cameras all around the factory in these red boxes that just said in Chinese, high voltage, so nobody went into the trees to bother them. And they, they filmed this company for 49 days. 
Now, in a 49-day period, they calculated that there should have been about something like 1,600 deliveries. In 49 days, the company had six. It was a complete fraud. Six deliveries in 49 days. So they have some incredible resources. Should, should we take? I'm one, sorry. Go ahead. One more two questions. Yeah. Then this this stuff works with small micro caps. I mean, with the large companies, <coughs> institutional investors step in. Wow, my time's going fast. Um, not true. Companies like NQ Mobile. $1.8 billion market cap. Ambo Education, $1.5 billion market cap. They go after big companies. You need, you need big stock prices to do it. If the stock is too low, there's not enough spread. Fair enough, but what about the other institutional investors? They get they killed. Need? They do. Can't you argue that the presence of these short companies uh, reduces the, I guess, the incentive for companies to overinflate their financials? You know what? When shorting is done correctly and honestly, it's a ve it's a very good function. You know, for me, nobody knows how to read a financial statement like a short. They're this, they can read a financial statement and tell you what the chairman had for breakfast. Really. Um, but when it's done when it's done honestly, it's great for the market. But unfortunately, there's honest and dishonest, and there's both there. And China's probably seen you know, more of the dishonest part than the honest. And you're classifying dishonest short companies as companies that only focus on shorts versus... I'll companies. make it simple for you. These are the most sophisticated people that I know in the financial statement industry. If you're a short and you're 90% wrong, you're a criminal. If you're 50% wrong, I'll buy into it. That's the game. If you're 10% wrong, you're a genius. You're right. But the shorts in attacking the Chinese companies were brilliant. And they knew to include certain things that would infuriate Chinese chairmen. And that was a really effective strategy because they realized that Chinese, you know, that people don't make good decisions when they're mad. And a short attack is very similar to a heart attack. It's sudden, doesn't come with a sign that says heart attack. And everything that you do in those opening moments dictates the rest of the story. Right? So they banked on the chairman making incredibly bad decisions in the opening moments. And they did. Okay, well, sorry, time is running out. Uh, let's thank Mr. Bernstein for insightful talk.